Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, it's nice to see all of you out here. Some of you are familiar faces. And tonight I'm going to be talking about something very different from what I've talked about before here, and that is reindeer, riders of the night sky, as I think of them. And this is going to be about the life, legends, and lore of reindeer. How many of you know Rudolph? Okay. How many of you have, uh, how many of you know Sven, the lovable, lovable reindeer in the Frozen films? Yeah, a lot of hands go up. How many of you have ever met a reindeer in person? One. One, two, that's it. Well, what I'm going to talk about tonight is how I got interested in reindeer because of my own first personal encounters with reindeer. And then I'm going to give you a lot of facts about reindeer. And finally, I'm going to tell you why people think that reindeer can fly. We wanted to have a real reindeer here tonight. But you know, it's only 13 days till Christmas, and Santa's reindeer are resting up for the big night, because they are going to be so overworked that night. And the, he has apprentice reindeer, and the apprentices visit shopping malls so that kids can get, up a, get a chance to, to meet them in person. And this one was just down at the North Park Mall a couple of weeks ago in, in Dallas. So my first encounters with reindeer, I'm going to start off with the first one in Scotland in 1969, and then Norway about 10 years later, and Texas about 10 years later. And the Scotland one was interesting. A long story short, I was on my first trip to Europe, traveling with my college roommate. And we traveled by train <clears throat> and hitchhiking all around the British Isles. And when we were in Scotland, one of the places we visited was the Cairngorm Mountains in the Scottish Highlands. And up on the top of the mountains, it was cold, sleet mixed with rain. Down on the bottom, below there, you know, down at, at uh, road level again where the roads were, it was just cold rain. And we were wet, and we hitchhiked into the small town nearby, trying to find a bed and breakfast to stay for the night. And the person who gave us a ride hitching in said he didn't know of any. That area wasn't developed for tourism like it is now. So he dropped us off at a tiny grocery store, little tiny grocery store. And we went in and asked the lady who ran the grocery store, do you know any places where we could stay tonight, a B&B, a, &B, a bread and be uh, bed and breakfast? And she didn't, but there were six people standing in line to pay for their groceries. And she said, does anybody here know where these two wet girls can stay? for tonight, and this elderly man at the very end of the line said, yes, they can come home with me. <clears throat> so we came home with this guy, we got there, and it turned out his wife was an American. And in front of this very fireplace, she let us dry out in front of the nice cozy fire and fix supper for us and gave us a place to stay at very standard bed and breakfast rates and fixed big Scottish breakfast for us the next morning. And the man said he would take us to the train station to get back on the train we wanted to go to the next place at. And, um, but first he had to go feed his reindeer. So he took us around the house to the back and there was a paddock, as they call a corral in Britain, and it had three or four reindeer in it, including a pure white reindeer. And he introduced us to all of his reindeer by name. I didn't remember the names, but the neat thing was the pure white one. He said it was the only pure white reindeer in Scotland. I thought it was pretty cool to have reindeer in your backyard, but really neat to have a pure white one like that. That isn't the picture of that white one, but there is a connection, and I'll tell you later. And then in 1976, my husband and I were on a long road trip in Norway and Sweden. And up above the Arctic Circle, we stayed one night with a Sami reindeer herding family. Sami are the native people who live up there. Sometimes they're called Laplanders, too. And the Sami took us out the next morning. The man said, I want you to meet my reindeer before you go. And all of the reindeer had names, so he introduced us to them like that. Well, that was the first two times. The third time was right here in Texas, and we were down at the Galleria Shopping Mall in Dallas. And we went to see the Christmas decorations, which are always so pretty there. 
And I also noticed that they had a sign saying Santa and his reindeer will be here tonight. Well, we didn't even see Santa and his reindeer because the mall was crowded with all these kids that had come to see Santa and his reindeer. But later that evening, as we were leaving, trying to get out of the parking lot at the Galleria, and you may have experienced this, was awful. It was bumper to bumper traffic, edging along inch by inch, and in front of us was a large white van, and our, we were about that close to it. And we'd start and stop and start and stop trying to get out of the parking lot of the mall. And all of a sudden, the van's back doors opened wide like this, and two big reindeer looked out. And they looked out, and they looked at us, and they started out <laughs> of the van. And my husband Tom and I looked at each other, and we were both thinking the same thing. The insurance company will never believe it when we say that our car was bashed in by Santa's reindeer. And just then the people who owned the reindeer that they brought to the mall, they saw in their side mirrors what was happening and they rushed out and pushed the reindeer back into the van and closed it and padlocked it tightly. So that was the nearest encounter with uh, accidental encounter with reindeer. Well, between 2006 and 2019 this year, I've had quite a lot of other encounters with reindeer. The first in Mongolia in 2006, and I didn't even know at the time that Mongolians had reindeer. Since then, I've been visiting and photographing reindeer in Mongolia several times, Alaska, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Scotland. So here's some from Mongolia, just last summer. This is from, uh, this is from Sweden in August of this year. And this one is a pure white reindeer, the second one I'd ever met, which was earlier this year, and it was in January of this year, so we were there for the Arctic winter above the, above the Arctic Circle, and this one is in Norway. Very, very friendly, because I had food in my hand. You just can't see it there. But my biggest surprise came two years ago, when I went back to Scotland because of a book that I'm writing, and I wanted to retrace the, um, wanted to retrace the route that I had taken that very first time in 1969 when I went around Great Britain. And we got to the town where I had stayed with the people who had reindeer, and I found out that it was a reindeer site. It was a famous place. It didn't have a sign like this when I stayed with them, but it is the Cairngorm Scotland Reindeer Center. And one of the rooms I remembered with the pine paneling and everything has now the reception desk on the right and the gift shop. They don't always have reindeer in there. They did it for that picture. And they still have reindeer out back. And I discovered when we went there that this man who was in the grocery store who gave us a ride to his place and said I could stay overnight with him and his wife is named Mikael Utsi, and he's a famous Swedish Sami person from the north of Sweden. And he, in 1952, brought over a herd of reindeer to start free-ranging reindeer in Scotland. They had been extinct in Scotland uh, for, for 800 years. And so he's famous for reintroducing reindeer to Scotland. And it turned out that his wife, who cooked dinner for us and breakfast for us and took such good care of us, she's a famous American anthropologist who had studied Mongolian reindeer herders. So I've been learning a whole lot about this just accidental connection with these people long, long ago. And that white reindeer that I met, I found out was named Snowflake. And I met her almost on her first birthday because I was there in May of 69 and she was born in May of 68. So let's look at some of the reindeer facts that I have been learning over the past years about these really interesting animals. The family they belong to is Cervidae, which means the deer family, and their particular species is Rangifera tarandus, and there are several subspecies depending on what part of the globe they live on, live on and where their, um, what their physical characteristics are. Reindeer are thought to have originated in North America three to 4,000 years ago and they eventually migrated to other parts of the world. In Europe, reindeer lived as far, I said three to 4,000, I meant three to four million years ago, excuse me, three to four million years ago. And then they eventually migrated to other places in the world. In Europe, 
they were as far south as France and Spain. And in Asia, they were as far south as Mongolia and China. But then, about 11,000 years ago, after the last great ice age ended and the glaciers retreated, the reindeer followed and went north. All right, they don't live on the glaciers, but their vegetation changed. And so they can find what they need to eat up in the northern latitudes. So this is where they live now. The green is where they live in North America and touching over a few in, in uh, Greenland. And then this is where they live in uh, Europe and Asia, all the red there. So they range from Alaska and Canada. This is the different colors of different species of reindeer on there. But that's where they are in Alaska and Canada. Then they go to Greenland in northern Europe. They're in Scandinavia and northern Russia. And in northern Asia, they are still in Mongolia. They're certainly in Siberia. And the last ones that live as far south as Mongolia live in the very northwest part of it, just connecting right with, uh, with Siberia. And they live in very different habitats. The tundra, the forests, mountains, and islands, but almost all of them are above 50 degrees north latitude. So you have forest reindeer and tundra reindeer and mountain reindeer. All right. So they live in very different habitats. The population today is about three to four million, but it fluctuates because of diseases that they have and because of climate change, because of oil drilling and things that have driven them off their, their natural habitat. They're called reindeer in Europe and Asia. In the various languages of Europe and Asia, it's translated from the word reindeer, which comes from an old Norse word, which means a deer or a horned animal. But over here in North America, the names for them are caribou. So if you've heard of caribou, that's really just a reindeer. And it's a French Canadian word that comes from some native people who live in that area. Calipou, not the people, but the word, which means a digger of snow. And you'll see why they named reindeer from digger of snow. Reindeer can be domesticated also. So you have domesticated reindeer and you have wild reindeer. Two to 3,000 years ago, they were domesticated in Asia and southern Siberia. And in different places, they have different names now. So that whether they're wild or domesticated, in Europe and Asia, they're reindeer. But over here, if they're wild, they're caribou. But if they uh, are domesticated, and there are a few domesticated herds around, mainly for Christmas events and for children to pet and things like that, then over here in North America, the domesticated ones are called reindeer. The males are called bulls. They're not called stags, except by a few people in North America. But the correct name for the males is bulls. And they're about four to five feet tall at maximum, six to seven feet long, and they weigh up to more than 500 pounds. And in the autumn, they mate with 15 or 20 females. The females are called cows. And they're smaller, smaller in height. They're only about five to six feet long. And they'll weigh about half what the males do. And they have one baby a year. It's very rare to have twins, but it does happen occasionally. And the newborns are called calves. Isn't that sweet? This one's only about four days old. I took that picture in Sweden in August of this year, and they'd had four baby reindeer born right there in the early part of May. So calves are born during May up to early June. They weigh about nine to 15 pounds when they're born. That's why it looks so small. And they get up almost immediately and within 24 hours they can run pretty well, which is good because that keeps them from predators. They grow really quickly and they begin to get the little antler buds, pedicules on, their, on the top there in about a month. So that's one that's really a very born within 24 hours. And it's about the size of my house cats, about 15 pounds. And then these are a few days old, the one I took in Sweden just in August. They ranged from four to nine days old, the ones I photographed there. And here's one at still just under a month old. 
And this one, my husband took a picture of this one, so this one is three months old. But you can't really see the little antler buds well on it. But uh, it was exactly three months old when we saw it. And this one now, it's into autumn, and you can see the antlers are beginning to grow. There's also a category of reindeer that are called oxen, or reindeer oxen. And these are domesticated reindeer, males, that have been castrated. And they grow stronger than non-castrated males. And they're much bigger, they live longer, they can actually get up to 700 pounds. And they're very docile, all right? You can handle them easily. And they're often used as so-called Christmas reindeer because they can be gentle around children and uh, they don't lose their antlers, so they've got big, big, nice antlers. And they're also often with domesticated uh, reindeer, the herders make uh, one of these reindeer oxen into the leader of the herd and he'll have a bell around his neck and the rest of the, uh, rest of the herd of, of reindeer will follow. So as I said, they're herd animals. Herds can range anywhere from 50 or so up to several hundred thousand of wild reindeer in certain places. And they band together in herds, they figure, but it, to protect themselves against predators, their strength in numbers. So their predators around the wo uh, world can be wolves, bears, foxes and lynxes tend to, uh, tend to prey on the smaller ones, on the babies. Um, so do golden e eagles have been known to eat the baby reindeer, the calves. Midges and mosquitoes up in Siberia and Alaska can drink up to a pint of reindeer blood a day, which is really quite a lot. And of course, humans are predators too. They hunt them. Humans have been hunting wild reindeer uh, for at least 20,000 years that we have archaeological evidence of. And see, he's got on reindeer clothing too. They're also migratory animals. They migrate both wild and domesticated. Domesticated don't just stay in your backyard. Reindeer herders in Siberia migrate with their reindeer to different places to get food. And wild ones, of course, migrate. So they can go 1,500 to 3,000 miles a year. They make the longest migrations of any land mammals. And in the summer, they go north up to the tundra when the tundra has ample food for them. That's where they go. They, do, they get food there and they also have their calves there. And then in the winter, they come south for shelter. They come down to slightly warmer weather, we'll put that in quotes, or they go into um, to the mountains and the, um, the forest to have shelter from the trees. They're also very fast land animals. Reindeer can run it go up to 50 miles an hour in bursts of speed, and they can sustain speeds of 20 to 30 miles an hour for several hours. So they're really fast. And this one I didn't know, they're also swimmers. And so they swim across wide rivers as part of their migratory routes, and they also can do swim in the ocean to get from one part to another. So look at, let's look at some other characteristics of reindeer. They have shorter legs and stockier bodies than most deer. And the domesticated ones get heavier than the wild ones, of course. And they have thick necks and big square noses. A lot of the deer that you see associated with Christmas, even pictures of them pulling Santa's sleigh, aren't actually reindeer. They've got pointy noses, they've got longer legs, thinner bodies. But that first reindeer picture I had up there and the second one that I had at the beginning of this, this presentation, those showed you what real reindeer look like. And they come in many different sizes, shapes, and colors. They can live up to 15 years in the wild and up to 20 years if they're domesticated. They have very distinct personalities. So I'm sure that's why the reindeer herders introduced me to theirs you know, by name, because they all have names. And uh, they're very curious. And as I said, they're herd animals. They're very sociable. They want to be with other animals of their type. And they're generally gentle and docile if they're brought up around people. So if they're domesticated, they can be very docile. But even in the wild, 
they'll be curious enough to come closer than most deer will to you because they want to find out who you are and what's going on. And people who herd them know that they can be very stubborn and cantankerous animals too. So let's look closer at reindeer from the very tip to the tail. Starting at the top with the antlers. This is the only species of deer in which both the males and the females have antlers. And they have the second largest antlers of any deer, second after moose. The men's, uh, the, ca the, the bulls, the bulls, the males, their antlers are bigger than the females, the cows. And the size and shape of those antlers varies according to several factors. So it's genetic, also the condition of the animal, if they in good shape or not, and the time of year also, and you'll see some examples of that in a minute. Antlers are bone, they're not horn. I heard somebody recently tell people that, oh, it's, it's horn, and come, no, no, it's not made out of the same thing as horn, like a cow's horn, or anything like that at all. They are born, they are, they're, sorry, they're bone, and they grow their antlers between spring and the end of summer, and they grow fast. When they're really growing, they go up to one inch a day. So what are antlers for? Well, one of the things is display. To say, You're spe I'm special, I'm the big man on campus, I'm the big man in the herd. And also to say, I'm the one you want to mate with, all right, because this, the females are attracted to ones that have the larger antlers. And even with females, the ones who have the larger, more impressive antlers have higher status among other females in the herd, or even in, in comparison with some of the males also. The males use them for fighting. In the autumn when they're getting ready to mate with the females, they establish their dominance by fighting with other males and the guy who wins is the one who gets those 15 to 20 females to mate with. And they also use them, by the way, for fighting off predators. And then in the winter, they use them for digging through the snow to get to the food that they're looking for in winter. And they do shed them. They shed every reindeer, they shed them once a year. And it has to do with hormonal changes that cause the shedding to occur. So after the males have, have mated, mainly in October, then by November, their antlers start throwing, uh, falling off. And reindeer oxen, though, because they're castrated males, they have different hormonal cycles, and so they don't lose their antlers until after the new year begins. And that's another reason you see when you see male reindeer at Christmas, they're going to be the castrated males if the, for for the uh, that have the big antlers to use for the Santa events, the Christmas events. Females keep them through the winter though, because they need to find food for themselves and the dig in the snow to find food for themselves and their calves, and also to fight off predators that be, might be trying to kill their calves. So they don't lose their antlers until late spring in May or June when they've just, after they've given birth. So they keep their antlers till the calves are born and then the females shed theirs. And that's why most of Santa's reindeer are girls. So when you see those pictures of the reindeer pulling the sleigh, if they've got antlers, they're either girls or castrated males. And then they start growing them again. So the males who lost theirs by November or so, they start growing again in March. The females, after they give birth, then they start growing in May or June. And as I said, they, the antlers grow fast, so they have full growth by the end of the summer. Now look at the antlers on here. Don't they look fuzzy? It's soft, that's called velvet. And a lot of times, you know, that's the term that, that we use for them, the velvet on their antlers. And what happens is the velvet is a thin, a thin covering of skin that's got a lot of hair, and it's, which makes it look soft and fuzzy, and it's got a lot of blood vessels. And those blood vessels provide nutrients to the bone that's growing the antler bone. And then once the, once the antlers stop growing, the hormonal changes cause them to stop growing, then they start shedding the velvet on there. So this one has it coming off now. 
And you can see how bloody it is because it had all this, has all those blood vessels that were supplying blood to the antlers as they grew. And so this guy has just lost all of his velvet now and he's ready for mating at that point. So we move down from the antlers to the eyes. And reindeer eyes even are interesting. They look brown to us, but if you shine a light on them, they look blue in winter and gold in the summer. And not too long ago, scientists found out that reindeer can actually see things in the ultraviolet light spectrum. Like if you turn on you know, black light on something that would show up that wouldn't show normally in your vision because you can't see in that spectrum. And they figure it's so that they can, they can see food that shows up in that spectrum of light and also where they can find their own herd because they can spot the fur and urine of other animals. So that helps them connect with their herd and also uh, see predators coming at them that you might not otherwise in the darkness. And reindeer noses are interesting. See how, how squarish they are? You know, they're big like that. They're not pointed like a lot of other deer. And reindeer are living in, say, in the winter. They're still above 50 degrees latitude north. And so they're in cold climates. And I've lived in Siberia in two winters. And if you breathe in too fast, you're climbing a hill or you're running or something, the icy air that goes into you can give you an ice cream headache in a minute. And you know how bad ice cream, you eat ice cream too fast? Well, that's, that's what happens to you. Reindeer are fixed where they don't do that. What happens with reindeer, fixed by nature, not by us. First off, they've got the fur goes all over the nose, which keeps it warm. And then inside the nose is this convoluted circular structure of bones, kind of like a chambered nautilus shell. And those bones hold tissues, very thin tissues, that have a lot of blood vessels in them. So when the reindeer breathes in, the air goes through all those passageways first, and it's warmed by the blood and the blood vessels before it actually goes into the reindeer's lungs. So reindeer don't get ice cream headaches. They're very well fixed for that. The mouth also, you can see, is covered with fur. Again, this is to keep warm. Oops, sorry. Go back one. Because reindeer are more vocal also than other deer. They make more sounds. And they figure that that is to communicate with others in their herd because they are such herd animals. And so if you're around reindeer, you're likely to hear grunts and snuffles and snorts and bellows. And if you're around it when the calves get separated from their mother or something, then they bleat and bawl to try to tell mother, oh, I'm over here, help me, help me, get over, you know, and find me again. They're also covered with fur from, as I said, the nose and lips all the way to the tail and all the way down to the feet. And that fur consists of two coats. It's very, very thick fur, two to three inches thick, composed of two coats. The inner coat is really woolly and fine. Have any of you, have any of you ever touched a reindeer hide? No. Oh, they are just so warm. And, and people use them. They cover, I don't have one, but they, they cover chairs with them and things like that, and they use them for bedding. And it's very thick, up to 2,000 hairs per square inch which is good insulation. And then on the outside, they have these coarser so-called guard hairs, about 600 of those per square inch, and they're hollow. And those trap air in between each of the hairs to insulate the, the uh, reindeer further. And it also gives them buoyancy when they're swimming. And they come in many colors, from black to white, and lots of shades of brown and gray in between, and they don't stay all one color. They change, their colors change during the year. So when their winter coat is really, really thick and much lighter in color than at other times of the year, and then in the summer, late spring and summer, they molt and they look terrible. They look really scuffy. Scruffy. So if you travel in Europe or in Siberia or Mongolia and you see them at that time of year, they're not going to look as pretty as we normally think of reindeer looking. 
this picture was one of the ones I took in, uh, in May of this year. And you can see the, the female reindeer there, she had a lighter coat that's falling off. And there's this browner coat growing up underneath. So their summer coat is not as heavy and it's brownish in color instead of what it's like in the winter. And then as winter comes on, they start growing their winter coat again and it gets lighter and much thicker. And of course, part of that is for insulation. And they're so well insulated that if the snow, when the snow falls on them, it doesn't melt. And if the reindeer sits down in the snow, which they do, the snow under them doesn't melt either. And the snow, in fact, provides even more insulation. So they're very well suited to the subarctic and arctic regions that they live in. And also it provides pretty good camouflage too. So this brings me to the subject of white reindeer. And white reindeer, pure white reindeer, that are white all year round, they don't change their coats like this, are very rare. This one I showed you earlier is actually Blondie. She's part of the Cairngorm reindeer herd. And she is the great, great, great granddaughter of Snowflake that I met in that reindeer herd um, back in 1969. Blondie was born in 2006, so they were just uh, almost 40 years after Snowflake was born into that herd. Definitely just genetically straight down the line related to her as her great, great such and such granddaughter. And since then, they've had two more pure white reindeer born in that herd. All descendants of Snowflake through Blondie, etc. You can see the camouflage value too, which is fine in the winter, but it's not really good in the wild, is it? And when it's not winter, because you, you're not very well camouflaged. So these reindeer stay white all year round, as I said, and the reason they are white is they inherit a recessive a gene from both parents. It has to come from both parents. And interestingly, this pure whiteness is also associated with deafness. So these reindeer are deaf too, and that doesn't help you in the wild at all, because you can't hear an, a predator coming or something. So that's why they're very rare in the wild. But it is also really interesting that the Cairngorm reindeer herd has now had four of them. And because those are free ranging reindeer, they're not, uh, they're not kept inside a corral. They, they go up on the mountains and they're out on their own. And they're not albino. When that famous reindeer herder who introduced uh, reindeer to Scotland introduced me to the white reindeer, I thought it was albino. And for years I've been telling people that I'd met the only white, you know, albino reindeer in Scotland way back then. But it turns out they are called, they're leucistic. Some people call it leucistic, all right? And the difference is that leucistic or leucistic reindeer have a diminution, they have reduced pigment but they're not albinos. Albinos don't have any pigment and even their eyes are pink or red, okay? And so these leucistic reindeer don't have that characteristic, but they are white all the time. So these kinds of white reindeer are considered very special among reindeer herding cultures. They, uh, they have spiritual importance to many people in Siberia. Uh, and Mongolia, and they're revered by the herders. And if you find one in the wild, it's really good. It can bring good luck and wealth and happiness. And so, uh, because they are so, so rare in the wild, people really rever them. And this brings me down now to the bottom of the reindeer. Their hooves, you can see how hairy they are, large and hairy. And they're splayed, they're spread out which gives some good traction on, uh, spreads their weight on uh, boggy tundra, really spongy when you walk on it, and then on snow in the winter. They've got four toes, the two big ones in front and the uh, two smaller ones in the back, and they make a clicking noise when they walk. So if you've ever been around reindeer and they're moving, you are going to hear click, click, click. And that's because there are tendons in their ankle bones connecting with the feet that slip over the bones and cause a clicking noise. And they can't turn it off. All right, so that could also tell predators that there's a reindeer out there because you could hear it 
clicking. You know the Christmas song? Up on the housetop, click, 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 down through the chimney with good Saint Nick. You know that song? Yeah, okay. Do you ever know where the click, click, click came from? You probably thought it was the reindeer hooves on the roof. Nope, it's the ankles moving, all right? If the reindeer were, didn't have that, you might hear their hooves, but you don't hear that characteristic click of their feet when they move. They also have concave hooves, like scoops, all right? And those also help them swim, in fact. The fact that they're curved like this, but that helps them dig through the snow. And that's where that caribou word came from, from the native people in North America, the native tribe that called them diggers of snow because they dig and pull out the snow to get down to the food. And that brings me to what do reindeer actually eat? Well, they're basically herbivores. They're vegetarians in general, but they have been known to eat bird's eggs and lemmings and fish. And so they'll eat what they can get, but most of the time what they're eating in the summer, in the early autumn, spring to early autumn, they're eating grasses and sedges. Uh, they love uh, willow and birch leaves and, and, and shoots on them in the spring. Ferns, berries, all kinds of things that you can find out on the tundra. And mushrooms. Keep that in mind. Reindeer absolutely love mushrooms. In the winter, as it gets on to winter, they start eating lichens off the trees. And once they've got the snow there, then what they do is paw through the snow to get to lichens because that is such an important part of their food. So this is what a lichen looks like in Siberia, but this is in the summer. It's a composite organism of a fungus and an alga. It's two things together. And this stuff is often called reindeer moss because there are many, many, many kinds of lichens, but the ones they absolutely love are these. And they can smell them under the snow. And these lichens are full of carbohydrates, which keep them warm in the winter. And 80% of their winter food is this. So that's why they're always digging in the snow in the winter to get to these things. They get minerals from drinking river water and they get salt from drinking the uh, urine of other animals and of humans if they're domesticated and a guy goes and pees outdoors, he's likely to find a reindeer coming up pretty soon to drink that off the, off the, off the ground. And in winter, they get their water from eating snow. So reindeer are interesting, reindeer are cute, but that isn't the reason that people domesticated them two to 3,000 years ago or have been hunting them for at least 20,000 years. Cuteness doesn't factor into it. Reindeer have many uses. And both wild and domesticated reindeer have been used for food, clothing, and shelter for thousands and thousands of years. The meat is eaten raw, right after the reindeer is killed. It's eaten frozen, sliced into really thin, paper-thin slices like prosciutto, uh, dried and smoked, also cooked, of course, and even you can buy reindeer meat in, in cans. These pictures are from Finland. I just took them last summer just to show different ways in which reindeer meat is served, even reindeer snacks in bags like uh, potato chips. And the milk isn't just for the calves, because once reindeer were domesticated, humans started milking them too. And so that's important to some of the reindeer herders, especially in places like Mongolia and southern Siberia. Because their milk is very thick, very creamy, 22% butterfat. Ours is, if you just drink whole milk at home, it's 4% butterfat. Think about this with 22%. So it's full of calories, vitamins, protein, and the Mongolians also make it into reindeer cheese. Here's some examples of the clothing made out of reindeer hides. And see the, the big, looks like a rug behind this one. That is a decorative rug made out of different colors of reindeer hide. Plus all this clothing is reindeer also.
This one's made out of lighter deer hide, lighter in, in weight, but you can see the reindeer decorations on the collars and cuffs. Also, reindeer hides are used for making yurts and, um, and teepees, depending on what part of the world the reindeer herders live in. And so, and they don't have to be herders, they can be from wild reindeer too, of course. And um, so this is one of the examples from Russia. And the bones and the antlers are made into a lot of different kinds of artifacts. Tools, toys, buttons on your clothes, decorations on your clothes, jewelry, uh, religious objects and things, all made out of antlers and bone. And medicines are made out of the velvet on the antlers when they're growing. And in some places, it's very cruel. They cut off the reindeer's antlers instead of letting them shed naturally. All right, they cut them off when they're still in the velvet and then sell this, uh, the, the outside velvet to mainly the Chinese who believe in that as uh, um, something that can make a medicine for them. And their tendons are braided together to make lassos. By the way, in, in Britain and other places, cutting off the reindeer's antlers is, is outlawed. Okay, so there are some parts of the world that are, uh, that are very good about that. Trans, uh, transportation is another important use. Uh, they think that, uh, that reindeer have been used for transportation since about 2,000 years ago too, part of domesticating them. And they're used as pack animals. Uh, here, they're, these are nomads. There's their, their house, which comes down. It's got all the reindeer hides. They pack it up. Their clothing, all their you know, utensils and things packed onto the reindeer to move to another place. 2,000 years ago, they were harnessed to pull sleds. There's archeological evidence of that, but it takes up to two years to train a reindeer for pulling. And they often use those castrated males for pulling the sleds because they're more docile and easily trainable. Usually there's one reindeer per sled, but uh, sometimes you have teams of them like Santa does. Also here, this is in Siberia, they're actually pulling carriages that are on sled runners across, that go across the tundra. And people ride reindeer also. And in fact, this is a, an image of that made out of different colors of, of reindeer fur. Nomads ride them as they are moving from one place to another. So they've got pack animals with them and they've got the ones that the nomads ride, just like we ride horses. And uh, again, they, they have different ways of riding. Sometimes they ride right on the back, other times closer up to the shoulders. And they're also used for sport, for reindeer pulling sleds for sled races. How about this in Norway? Reindeer racing with the jockeys on skis behind them. And this is reindeer racing where people are racing the reindeer. This is in Anchorage. This is a three block long race on the main street of Anchorage, Alaska that they hold every year to raise money for charity. Sort of like the running of the bulls in Pamplona, only north. This is my favorite. You can have them as wedding attendants. Wouldn't you like to have a reindeer for bridesmaids and bridesmaid or maid of honor and uh, best man? Oops, sorry. Let me go back a bit because then I want to tell you something about the the legends, the lore, the myths surrounding reindeer. There are some cultures that have creation stories that say the Great Spirit made the earth out of different parts of reindeer. There are others who are reindeer herders who believe that there is a particular reindeer in their herd who is their spirit animal who will protect them from danger. And this one, some Siberians believe that reindeer were created by the sky god not only to provide food and transportation on earth, but also to lift the human soul up to the sun on an annual soul voyage to the heavens. So now we're getting into flying reindeer. 
but we connect flying reindeer with Santa. So how did that happen? Well, back in 1823, Clement Clark Moore wrote a poem that I think almost all of us are familiar with, A Visit from St. Nicholas. We also call it Twas the Night Before Christmas, the first line of the poem. And that, in that one, Santa had eight reindeer connected to his sled. So that's where we have the, that's where we first got the notion of this. He actually had taken it from different bits, parts of folklore, from European folklore, and put them together into this poem. And the one I mentioned earlier up on the housetop, click, 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 that one dates from, it's a song dating from 1864. How many of you watch the Macy's parades on Thanksgiving? Yeah. Well, back in 1898, 110 of the Sami reindeer herders from northern Sweden brought over 500 reindeer by ship to New York and then across the U.S., I think to Seattle by train, and then by ship up to Alaska to teach native Alaskans who only hunted wild reindeer to teach them how to um, domesticate reindeer and have them as a sustainable source and, and a, a source you could count on all the time of uh, meat and hides. And so this was in 1898, and then in the 1920s, the company who, biggest company that owned the domesticated reindeer up there, paired up with Macy's to do a parade, a Christmas parade in seven major cities in the US that featured Santa with real reindeer pulling his sleigh. And the whole point was to promote the sale of reindeer meat and hides. Well, everybody liked the reindeer, but who wants to eat Santa's reindeer? So it didn't work very well as sales promotion. Then along comes Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which all of, whom all of us know. And Rudolph dates from 1939. And it was a poem written by an advertising cop copywriter for the Montgomery Ward's department stores. They wanted to give out a free booklet to kids to promote the stores. And so he came up with the, this poem that we all know. It was so popular that in 1947 it was turned into a book that was sold in, in bookshops. And then in 1949, Gene Autry record, recorded the song that we all know of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and that was a big hit. And then Rudolph is just still everywhere. Books and comic books and films and video games and TV specials, you still see Rudolph now, but he's, he dates from 1939, he's older than I am. And then you have other films that feature reindeer but they don't have the red nose. Oh, and something I forgot to tell you about the red nose. You know the nose I was telling you with all of the circular chambers in it that the air goes through to warm it? Well, if you put the reindeer's nose, the real reindeer, under thermal imaging, it glows. <laughs> so there's a scientific basis for Rudolph. One of my favorite reindeer films is Prancer. If you haven't seen Prancer, you definitely should. And of course, in Frozen 1 and Frozen 2, Sven the reindeer was, uh, Actually, they do the reindeer movements really well to animate them, but where he's got his goofy looking eyes in front aren't like a reindeer at all, but he's still a very lovable reindeer. But the idea of flying reindeer goes back to really ancient beliefs. It didn't start with the, with the poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas in 1823. These things are called deer stones, and these are in Mongolia, and they date back 3,000 years, some of them, and they are erected at sacred sites and over people's graves. Let me show you a little closer up. Can you see the reindeer that are flying up there? Okay, they've got reindeer horns, there you go. It looks like reindeer horns, and they're all going in this direction. They're flying. And anthropologists think, and this is carved, this one, you, you can see those better, they've got two color on them, but this one's, it's also carved deer flying up like this. And anthropologists think that this is connected with ceremonies conducted by shamans, or shamans, as you say here. And the shaman is a spiritual leader, uh, a healer, it's like a medicine man in Native American uh, beliefs, and they often have deer antlers in their costumes. You see up here? See the deer antlers on that one? And they go into a trance. They beat their drums and they take certain kinds of drugs, plant, plant drugs, they derive from plants, 
and they go into a trance and they and the people with them who believe in them believe that they are flying up to the upper world or down to the lower world to bring back advice for humans they, to, and how to heal yourself, etc. So the shamans are still you know, very active in many parts of the world. You see this one? The antlers are really very obvious there. This one from the Russian Far East, he's got small ones, but up on top. And so they think that these deer stones are connected with the use of antlers in, these, uh, in the costuming and also in the sense of being able to be transported sometimes or often on the back of a reindeer to, for, the, for the shaman or shaman to go up into the upper world or down into the lower world to gain knowledge from the spirits. Also, there are many shamans have reindeer tattooed on their skin. And they have actually found in ancient graves in southern Siberia, they've dug up people who were mummified, and so they still had their skin, and they've got deer on them. Yeah, so tattooed on them. Now, I will confess to you that I don't have any tattoos, but if I ever get a tattoo, it's going to be a big rack of reindeer antlers across my shoulder blades. I, would, I think that would be really, really cool. So why would reindeer fly? We haven't answered that question yet. And why did so many thousands of years ago people think that? Well, there's something we call magic mushrooms. Mushrooms that have hallucinogens in them. And there are certain mushrooms that have these hallucinatory effects, but those mushrooms are poisonous for people to eat and yet reindeer can eat them. And because of their digestive system, they've got four stomachs like a cow, all right? And so in their digestion, it gets rid of the poisons, but it keeps the stuff that gets you high. So when a reindeer spreads its legs in peas, if you drink the reindeer urine, you get the equivalent of, say, the LSD or the marijuana or whatever. Now, I don't know who came up with the idea of drinking reindeer urine. But in fact, it's something that is still practiced in parts of Mongolia, I have been told. And so as one reindeer herder told me, the whole notion of flying reindeer dates back to a bunch of stoned Mongolians thousands of years ago. So now you know the answer to that question. You might not want to tell your children, because we certainly don't want to get them on drugs, but that's what anthropologists think may well have been the reason for those reindeer stones, flying reindeer stones from so, so many thousands of years ago, and the, the myth, the notion that reindeer can actually fly. So I have three books to recommend to you. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about reindeer, this one is just fabulous. The Reindeer People Living with Animals and Spirits in Siberia. Piers Vitebsky is an anthropologist with the Scott Polar Research Institute at Cambridge University in, in Britain. And he's a wonderful writer. So this is not an academic book. It's full of wonderful information that's correct, but it's written in such a style you just, you just want to keep turning the pages because it's so good. So I highly recommend that one about learning about reindeer, period, but especially with a focus on Siberia. This one is Reindeer Herders in My Heart. It's by Sass Carey, and she's the head of Nomadicare, which is a charitable organization in the US that takes um, medical supplies to reindeer herders in Mongolia. And so she's very knowledge knowledgeable too. And this will tell you a whole lot also about the herders. And then this one is by Tilly Smith, Reindeer and Arctic Life. And Tilly Smith is now the owner, she and her husband, they're the owner of the Cairngorm Reindeer herd in Scotland that was started by that couple that I stayed with back in 1969. And this tells the history of that herd, and it also tells you a whole lot about reindeer around the world. And this one is, is all three of them are so worth reading. This one has a story I'd never heard before, and it was really fascinating. I had planned to read it to you tonight, but I knew this was going to run over time. What are we doing now? Are we okay? Yeah, we're doing okay. Uh, but I didn't have time to read the whole story to you. So in a nutshell, 
Back during World War II, when Britain and the Soviet Union and the US were, were allies, a reindeer was put aboard a British submarine at a Russian submarine base above the Arctic Circle, a place that I was in just last well, earlier this year in, in January. A reindeer was put into that, you'll have to read the book to find out why, it got on the submarine and it spent a month on the submarine coming from this Russian submarine base above the Arctic Circle across the North Pacific and to Britain where the, the ship actually came from with the British captain. And during that month, that submarine actually saw action in the North Pacific in a major battle in the North Pacific. And the reindeer made it all the way. The sailors were really got really attached to her and named her Pollyanna and she ended up in a zoo, that wasn't the original intent, but she ended up in a zoo in Britain where she was a very popular animal. So people may have been thinking that reindeer could fly for thousands of years, but Pollyanna is surely the only reindeer in history who has ridden in a submarine. So the reindeer and I thank you for coming tonight to hear their story, and we wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Thank you. Questions, comments, protest. Questions, uh, questions. <laughs> before we take the first question, I'm going to show you, you know, the print media is, is declining. The best way you can find out about our programs is to sign up for e-news. And it's real easy. He'll show you the website in just a second. And second page, please, just go to that website. Even I can do that. X and then put in your uh, email at the top and sign up. That's all it takes. All right. Any questions, comments, or protests? <laughs> questions. Come on. We have some students here. Don't you want to make an A? <laughs> now that they know why reindeer fly, I think they're going to make a big enough. Name. I was I was waiting for that one. <laughs> I wrote the. Pre yes, sir. I'm going to have to come over here where I can see you. Yeah. Um, I noticed that uh, oh, in a lot of the photos, some of the reindeer have very wide antlers and, mm -hmm. or, and some had very small spindly ones. Is that kind of a geographical thing or is it just seasonal? It, it's geographical, it's seasonal, and it's which gender they are. Okay, so the females will have smaller antlers, uh, although they can branch out and do a lot of stuff. Okay, but uh, they'll, be, they'll be smaller than the males. And it is also seasonal because when they're growing them in, they look thinner and spindlier and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes, good question. Yes, question over here or, yeah. Let me bring you the mic. Let me come around. Yes, perfect, thank you. You know I have short arms, thank you. Uh, I was wondering uh, if there are any, uh, like, animals within driving distance that we can see? Oh, I asked the people at, uh, at North Park Mall a couple of weeks ago. They had two reindeer there for the kids to pet. And I asked them where they came from because we had thought about trying to get one for tonight here too. And they said they were from, I believe it was 3-M Entertainment. And they were about um, one and a half hours drive south of Dallas. All right, so if I were you, you know what I'd do is I'd Google reindeer in Texas and you might find some places that, that have them. Um, now I should have checked on that before I came tonight. It's a good question. Yeah, if you want to get up close and personal with them, you know. We were actually thinking about having a reindeer on the stage until I found out the cost. Yep, <laughs> and they were busy. They're busy, they're too busy at this season. You gotta book them months in advance, which is true. Uh, so you were saying, the, uh -huh. just to clarify, so if you drank the urine then the hallucinatory well, they make you think you saw. Don't try it. <laughs> so you, they make you think you saw the reindeer fly, so that's where it came from? Yes, yeah. yes. And in fact, uh, the people at the Cairngorm reindeer herd who run that herd, in the free-ranging reindeer in Scotland, they said when they go up on the mountains to check on them, because they vaccinate them and they do stuff to keep them healthy, they mostly use them now for tourists. You can go on walks with those reindeer. They said, but when it is the season when certain kinds of mushrooms are, are you know, that pop up, 
they will go out there and they've got a reindeer missing and they go looking. They walk miles over those mountains trying to find the reindeer, see if it's broken a leg or something that needs help. And they'll find it laid out on the ground with all the mushroom stems around it. <laughs> because it's done that. And they said other times they can tell when they've eaten these kind, and there's more than one kind of the hallucinatory mushrooms. They will see the reindeer, the, a particular reindeer, come jumping down the hillside sideways. <laughs> and, they, and, you know, and just kind of going around and acting funny. And they know you've been into a mushroom patch somewhere. So the reindeer do get high on it themselves too, apparently. <laughs> yes. Any other question? I have a question okay. here. You know, that's an excellent question that you get an A for that. Tell your teacher. <laughs> so the gene that makes uh, the fur white, mm -hmm. is that a dominant or recessive it's gene? It's recessive. It's okay. recessive. And if I remember correctly, they get it from both, if, if both parents have that gene, okay, and then the calf has a 50-50 chance of being born pure white. Okay. Okay. If only one parent does, it's only a 25% chance. All right. And you can see some of the whiteness in other reindeer in this herd uh, that st have you know white splotches on them, stuff that don't go away when they get their summer coat, and that's because they have you know they may have that gene, but they didn't develop it. Okay. But it is recessive. Yeah. All right. And you can find out much more about it in that book, uh, the one, the last book I mentioned, the Arctic uh, reindeer and Arctic life. Yes. What are reindeer uh, subspecies of, like? Uh, of deer. Uh, okay, okay, so, so it's rain, the, the, the family is, is deer, yeah. okay, cervidae. The species is Rongifer tarandus, which means reindeer. And then there are, depending on who and what, who you listen to or who you read and what um, time period they're talking about, between nine and 14 subspecies. So for instance, there's one that's called a porcupine reindeer for the Porcupine River up in, in I believe it's Canada or Alaska. That's a subspecies. They don't look like a porcupine. They're named for the river around which they live. And they've got... Some of their antlers sometimes will be bigger and, and flatter, sometimes more like a, a moose antler will be, or something like that. So it, the subspecies, again, whether depending on what you're reading, there some people say 12, some there were 14, and now two of them are extinct. Some say there's not enough difference in the others so that there's only nine subspecies. So you think deer, reindeer, and then subspecies of reindeer. Okay. And that depends on where they live, what their characteristics are physically. Okay, because there are some on Svalbard Island off the coast, north coast of, of, of Norway, up in the Arctic Circle, and they, are, they have much shorter legs, mm -hmm. and they have evolved over thousands of years on that island. And so they've got smaller bodies, they're stockier, and they're closer to the ground, shorter legs. And you see a picture of them, you know, that's a Svalbard subspecies right there because of that physical characteristic. Yeah, good questions. Some more? A future biologist. Yes, two of them right there. Yeah. The, uh, uh, to, so uh, just to follow up on his question, can a deer and a reindeer have a baby? Are they two separate species? I don't know the answer to that. The, uh, I don't know. It's a good one. I'll I remember my biology professor in college said, if a daddy and a mama can have a baby, they're one species. Now, they may be a part of different subspecies. Mm -hmm. But it, and and their rep and their offspring have to reproduce because you have a donkey and a horse makes a mule, but mm -hmm. the mules can't reproduce. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, those yeah, are, that's, just, that's a good yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, and I don't know. Now to follow up on the white, uh, I do know in the in the Native Americans of North America, the white buffalo was considered godly, mm -hmm. a deity. Mm -hmm. So if a white buffalo came, they found one, it was treated with utmost respect. And one, there was one in Greenville or Commerce about um, five to 10 years ago, and somebody killed it. And Native Americans came from all over North America to have a, a, a special uh, pow powwow to honor the, the life of that, mm -hmm. that white buffalo. So it's- I can believe that, yeah. It's similar, and even, even white deer also among Native Americans, because I once heard, and this isn't reindeer, this is an, another kind of, 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 of deer in that, in that species of deer, that um, it, the, the Native Americans said, if you get, this was out in West Texas, if you get a snake bite, 
the, the, you, if you can, you use the kidney of a white reindeer to pull out the venom and you won't die. Well, if you've got a snake bite about, uh, that's going to kill you, you're not going to be able to find a white reindeer, <laughs> right, <laughs> and get its kidney in time to save yourself. But it's what it's really saying is the powerful spirit of a white reindeer. So they do feel that way. And, I, and I'm sure it depends on the different groups of Native Americans, too. That was an interesting observation you made earlier. Any questions, comments, protest? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and there being none? Um, Sharon, did you bring any of your books to sell? No, I didn't, but I bought my reindeer herd. <laughs> All right, because we couldn't get a regular one, a real reindeer on stage tonight. This is Sven, the baby reindeer, very shy, hiding under the table. And all the others came from Norway and Sweden. And I've even got my own pure white reindeer that I got. Its name is Gabba, G-A-B-B-A. And that was the one I had a picture of early on in the presentation. I said I just, well, my husband took the picture of me meeting that one in January of this year up in Norway above the Arctic Circle. And I fed him a lot of reindeer moss, and he really liked me. Thank you. <laughs>